But I have a question I want to ask you. The question is, are you normal? Are you normal? And we think, well, I'm normal and everyone else is a bit weird. And although intelligently we think, well, no, we're, we're all a little bit weird, but when it comes down to it, we act as if we're the only normal people in the world and everyone else is a bit strange. But to be normal is something that we actually strive for. In fact, if something happened to you in, on your body or physically, and it, you might get worried and go, wow, what's going on? You go to the doctor and the doctor would say, oh yeah, that's just normal. And you're like, oh, that's much better. It's normal. I'm not so weird. And we find a great comfort in not being alone, not being odd. We feel great comfort in being with a crowd. But there are some people that say, no, well, I don't like to be with a crowd. I like to be, uh, I'm, I'm a non-conformist. But even non-conformists have a certain conformity to be able to be a non-conformist. And if you don't meet that non-conformity conf confirmation, then you're, you're not a non-conformist. You're really conforming to everyone else. So whether, whatever the dynamics are in the society, we always just want to be normal with, with some people that we can associate with. And, and, and that's why Jesus says broad is the, is the way and wide is that road that leads to destruction because we think, well, if everyone's doing wrong, I'm just going to be one in the crowd. I mean, who's going to pick me out to get more punishment than anyone else? And I remember at school, whenever I was in trouble, I felt so much comfort that I was in trouble with somebody else. If I was there by myself, it never was as fun as when I was in trouble with somebody else. And I thought, well, at least I'm not by myself. And I would take comfort with this other person being with me. And we do this in society that we generally call normal is whatever the populace is, whatever the majority is. But if that's the case, then fidelity in marriage is abnormal. It's not normal for a Christian to really follow Jesus. If we're going to go by the populace, if we're going to go by the majority and say, well, whatever the majority is, that's, that's the norm. But the question is, what is normal? Do you know what normal is? Normal is manufacturer's settings. That is normal. As a mechanic, we're always taught that whatever the situation that you're repairing is, you'll always base it upon what it was originally. And if anything was different, then it was abnormal and needed repairing. So that is what normal is, manufacturer's settings. And it didn't matter if every car in the world had an oil leak. That didn't make it normal. It still needed repair. And all the cars couldn't get comfort from all the other cars just because everyone's got an oil leak. It needed fixing. And so when we reflect on the manufacturing of human beings, when man, when man was made what he was made and how he was made and what he was when he was created is normal even if no one ever is like that again it doesn't change the fact of what normal is so i invite you to open your bibles with me to ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29 and the bible tells us that the solomon all his wisdom concluded this lo this only have i found that God hath made man upright. That's normal. Manufacturer settings is to be upright. Upright just simply means to be perfect, to be wholesome, to be, to be pure. That's how God made man. Then there's this, this big little word, 
but. But this, this conjunction is used to contrast two things. But there is a contrast to consider. And that is, God made man perfect, but the contrast is that man, that man has sought out many inventions. And you think, wow, that's pretty good to be an inventor. What's wrong with being an inventor? Well, this word inventions, this Hebrew word inventions, is only used twice in Scripture. Only used twice. And it doesn't mean inventions how we think of it today. Let us, use, let us see this word how it's used in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 15. And we will see what man has done. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. That word engines is the same word that's translated in the Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastes text as inventions. The word engine. It says, um, he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and on the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones where with all and so on so an engine was a war device to shoot arrows to destroy other people so man made god upright but men have made Things to destroy. Destructive elements. And we can think, well, that's you know the war, the, the, the things that we have for war. But it even includes our own tongue. Which has the power to slice up people. So when God made man... It was normal for him never to hurt anybody. It's abnormal, actually, to have any form of fighting, whether it be self-defense or, or um, aggression or whatever it is. That is actually abnormality. But if you went on the populace, it's actually abnormal not to defend yourself or to, to, to fight in some way or another, whether it be words, whether it be sentiments, or whether it be physical, whatever it is. So what happened for man to fight? Now, Brother Marcus shared this morning about Adam and Eve and how they were straight on the self-defense, straight after sin. Because stress, to be afraid, causes two reactions, to fight or to flight. And both of those, whether it's an aggression or a defense mechanism, are both inventions or methods employed for war. You either run away to give yourself some space or you attack. Either one is one of these inventions that man has come up with. And so stress causes us to have, these, have this aggression and this in turn into guilt and guilt turns into sickness and so forth let's turn our bibles to romans chapter 3 and let's read what this text has to say romans chapter 3 and we'll see that the scripture describes it very accurately romans chapter 3 and starting in verse 10 and verse through to verse 19 it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. 
that way that man made, that was normality. Everyone has become abnormal. And so it's normal to be abnormal. And then we get accustomed to that. But let us align ourselves back up with this way. All have gone out of the way. How? They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is what? Is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they use deceit. And poison of asps is under their lips. So even to, to misrepresent is a form of self-defense. Many people don't want to be honest because they want to dodge the situation. They want to pull out of any trouble that's coming. So we're going to just talk sweetly here and get ourselves out of trouble. That's an invention that man has come up with in his abnormality. And then it says in verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Now these things, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, have a huge impact upon our mental health, how we think, how we, how we function. And mental health is so important in that you are what your brain is. You are a brain. That's it. And so these, um, this fighting or defense, guilt and the lack of peace is the source of all mental illness today. Now we have a stage of mental illness and there are some minds that are, are worse than others in the results that have taken place. But that doesn't make any man better than other men. But this death, this, this killing, and this death is a result of sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for, for that all have sinned. So what does sin bring? Death. And what is, what is death? Death is the breaking down of the life forces. Now Jesus says, when he was speaking to Adam and Eve, he says, if you eat of this tree, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And when you look at the Hebrew wording of that, it translates, dying you shall die. In other words, the day they didn't eat of it, they just didn't drop dead. But they started dying the day they ate of it. And this process of dying is manifest in disease. Disease. Disease is just the outworking of death. That's all it is. And whether it be bodily disease or mental disease, it's all the same. Because mental disease is the breaking down of your organ called the brain. And when it breaks down, it can't think. And you as an individual break down with it. And any other organ of your body which gets diseased is the result from sin. In other words, all disease, all sickness comes from sin. I read a statement from Councils to Teachers, page 424, paragraph 3. It says...
But through sin, the whole human organism is deranged. The mind is perverted, the imagination corrupted, temptations from without find an answering cord within the heart, and the feet slide imperceptibly into sin. Do you agree with that statement? That our imaginations and our thoughts are perverted and we fall into sin. And those sins cause us bodily damage. Whether we get chronic diseases of diabetes and heart disease and all these things. Even if they come from our parents. It's all because of sin. From the mind. And sin... Is a result of disobeying what? God's word. So if we disobey God's word, the result will follow that there will be bodily sickness and mental sickness, and these will manifest themselves in uncomfort, irritation, and the lack of peace and joy in one's life. And we need to really study this principle of cause to effect. Things don't happen for nothing. Things have a reason why they take place. And Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through to 23. Proverbs chapter 4. Let us turn there and read Proverbs 4. Twenty through to 23. It says, my son, my son, attend to my words, incline thy ears to my sayings, then let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are what? They are life to those that find them and health to what? To all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Are you sick? Am I sick? Are we sick? Then this has come forth from the human mind. In letting go of God's word, and letting go of God's word is simply sin. And the Bible says that sin brings death and death is manifest in disease and breaking down of the human life. And so the Bible says that if we then want to become normal, if we want to be restored back to the, manu the manufacturer's settings, if we want to be reset back to the way we were, then we want to take heed of God's word because they are life. Now, can you have life and then have disease? You can't because disease is just the breaking down of life. That's all. So if we have the life coming up, we cannot have disease. They are life to those that find it and health to all their flesh. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So now, when our bodies get ailments, do we endeavor to fix them up? Yeah? We spend a lot of money in repairing, trying to recover our bodies. Well, I want to share with you the best way to recover the whole lot. And that is first recover the thing that causes the body to fail. And that is the mind. I read from Councils on Health, page 324. It says, Satan is the originator of disease. And the physician is warning, sorry, and the physician is warring against his work and power. 
Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the disease from which men suffer have their foundation here. Where? Right there. Nine-tenths. How many is that? How much, what percentage? 90% of bodily disease comes from the brain. Now, what about the other 10%? Well, it probably comes from someone else's brain that attacks me or hurts me physically where it's outside of my control and my body gets damaged from an external, outside of my own, whether it be um, some virus that comes straight into me or whatever. But every s disease is traced back to someone sinning. And 90% of my own ailments come from my own brain. 90%. So then it would pay greatly to sort our mind, our mental health out so then our bodies will can recover. And even if someone sorts their mind out and even if their body doesn't get the time to recover and there is a death that takes place, the soul is saved. The soul is saved. And so it's better to go to heaven lame than go to hell whole. It's better to sort out the mind now, even if there's not the full time that it takes to recover the body. And even if we are unable to, to do this because of the, the, the curse, when Jesus comes, he will give a new body. And do you know that's the crowning act of salvation? That's the crowning act of the rebirth, in fact. That as my mind gets renewed, when my mind is renewed, then I will get a new body. Because the curse has devoured the earth. And so, my friends, the thing we need to worry about is the health of our mind. Above all things. We've got a sore foot, we've got a sore back, fair enough. But let's sort our mind out as a priority. Salvation is simply the working, the work of making someone whole. Is that just is salvation just some nice mental sentiment that we have that just helps us to be a little bit more cheerful in this world? Or is it the source of every bodily disease, including every mental disease? Of course, salvation is because salvation results in a perfect situation, body, soul and spirit. Turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, and we'll see the connection between sin and sickness. Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know my people do not consider. Now, is it a hard thing? For, a, for cattle to know the person who feeds them. Is it a hard thing? It's quite simple. And it says a lot about man not even being able to know God. In other words, we have less mental capacity than a cow when it comes to recognizing who is our maker. <laughs> the cow knows we don't. Sounds like we have this mental problem. Why? It says in the next verse. Let's read. It says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. Laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You, you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. 
from the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores they have not been closed neither bound up neither mollified with ointment this is our situation before receiving Jesus Christ and the gospel because the gospel work is to restore men in the whole it's a holistic approach to health and so because of sin you can see that the whole head from the the whole body is deranged because of sin look what david has to say in psalms 38 turn your bibles there with me to psalms 38 starting in verse 1 Psalms 38, it says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure, for thy arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am, tr I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. There is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the, of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee. My groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. Can you relate to that? This is the results of sin. Now salvation, when you look at the healings of Jesus, Jesus came to heal the people. And in releasing their bodies from certain sufferings, it awoke in their mind to seek mental health because that was Jesus' primary objective, their mind. That was his primary objective. And when he's healed people, he often used to say, Thy faith has what? Thy faith has saved thee. And the same words is what Brother Michael just said, Thy faith has made thee whole. So if thy faith has saved thee, and thy faith has made thee whole, then salvation is making one whole. That's what it is. That is salvation. And this is what Jesus has come to offer to us. Proverbs 14 verse 30. Let us turn there. Proverbs 14 and verse 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh. <laughs> a sound heart is the life of the flesh. But envy the rottenness of the bones. What do you want in your life? Are you carrying a burden that is too heavy to carry? Are you laden with iniquity? Well, Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are laden and are heavy burdened, and I will give thee rest. The heart is the life of the flesh. So when we come to Jesus with all our physical ailments and every discouragement, every discouraging experience we have ever made, we come to Jesus and what is he going to do for me? 
He's going to heal my heart. Because the heart, it says, the heart is the life of the flesh. Our great physician isn't up for just covering up the symptoms. He's not up for just giving something that, that, that sweeps it under the carpet and says, look, it looks pretty good now. And yet the disease gets driven deeper into the body and manifests itself in some other problem later. Like the medicine of today. The medicine of today reflects the preaching of today. That it's healing the people, God's people slightly by saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Outside of full commitment to Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus Christ wants to heal the mind of you and me. Can he do it? He made it. He's the manufacturer. He knows what settings it was before. No one else, no one else knows. We don't have any, anyone to go and check it out because there is none righteous, no, not one. Second Timothy 1 verse 7. A sound heart is the life to thy flesh. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter one and verse seven. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what he came. Fear, stress, is the whole problem. The stress is the whole world's problem. It's stress. People are stressed and then they fight. And fighting causes stress. And stress causes fighting. And it's just one big Domino effect that is crushing the world just from one simple thing, and that is fear. Why? Because we have left God. God is the only one that can give us love, His love. Not humanism, not sentimentalism, His principled love. And it says, He has come to give us power and of love and of a sound mind. So, how do you get mental health? Enough talking about it. How does one person get mental health? Well, as in the physical, so in the spiritual. How does one get bodily health? If you ate junk food all your life, what would your body be like? It'd be junk. You are what you eat. So, what does your brain eat? This is the question. What does your brain eat? John chapter 6 verse 54 and 55 tells us, John chapter 6, John chapter 6. Fifty four through to fifty six it says, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Here's the hope of every of all bodily ailments is that there will be a resurrection. Praise the Lord for that. But how do I get the new body? I have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. It says in the next verse, For my flesh is meat indeed, or food. It is real food. It is not fairy floss. It is the real nutritious thing for your brain. That's what he's saying. My 
flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now the Jews, when they heard this, just went, eating blood? No, we're vegan, we're vegetarian, or whatever they thought. That was odd to hear that. But because their mind was not normal, they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And so in verse 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they're life. That's what I'm telling you. I'm not talking physically eating my flesh and thinking that, my f that when you take the the bread that is really turning into his flesh. It's the spirit and life is what is uh, communicating. And so Jesus Christ that says the life is in the flesh. The life of the flesh is in the blood. In other words, Jesus' life, Jesus Christ and his teachings is the food that is nutritious. Mental food. It says in Sons and Daughters of God, page one hundred and. 178 paragraph 6 it says this pure healthful reading will be to the mind what healthful food is to the body you will thus become stronger to resist temptation to form right habits and to act upon right principles now there's a book company called reader's digest and um, that is exactly the point what you read you digest and what we read, we literally digest into our mental fabric. It becomes part of us. If we had no eyes, no ears, no avenues to the soul, and when we were born, we would become nothing. Because there is nothing to store in, to load up into the, to you as a person. So the question I want to ask you is, what is the type of, what, what's the type of food that you are eating mentally? Fundamentals of Christian Education. It says this. It says, If as newborn babes you desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, you will have no appetite to partake of a dish of evil speaking. But all such food will be at once rejected because those who have tasted the Lord, that the Lord is gracious cannot partake of the dish of nonsense and folly and backbiting they will say decidedly take this dish away i will not eat such food it is not the bread from heaven it is not eating and drinking the very spirit sorry it is eating and drinking the very spirit of the devil for it is his business to be the accuser of the brethren so it's talking about gossip to 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 get loaded up on other people's doings now, how many, how many of us feed upon other people's doings? We go, wow, I'm mentally hungry. Let's hop onto the news feed. And we feed away on what other people are doing. Is that going to give me health? No, it's not going to give me health. I can't expect health. So if I want to know how do I get mental health, then I need to consider what is my mental food coming into my mind it says it is best for every soul to closely investigate now this is up to you if you really want to be healed from from the situations then it says it is best for every soul to closely investigate what mental f food is served up for him to eat when those who come to you who love who live to talk and who are all armed and equipped to say report and will report it stop and think of the conversation that stop and think if the conversation will give spiritual help and spiritual efficiency and if the spiritual communication you may sorry that in spiritual communication you may eat of the flesh and drink the blood of the son of god these words express much it says, to, to whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. So many people have the opportunity to feast on 
Jesus and all that he is. And they say, no, thank you. We do not want that. He's rejected of men, despised. What sort of mental, what sort of exercise is it to be so religious and to think of Jesus all the time? That's what people say. And Jesus is still rejected in our day, despised, even by Christians. I don't mind going to church and having a little bit, but not too much. I don't mind a few greens, but I like to eat my fast food. Thank you very much. That is what spiritually we do. And it says, these words express much. We are not to be tattlers or gossipers or tale bearers. We are not to bear false witness. We are forbidden by God to engage in trifling, foolish conversation, in jesting and joking or speaking any idle word. Now, Jesus Christ says that any idle word we will have to give an account for in the judgment. Now, what is an idle word? What does the word idle mean? The word idle means it does nothing. When your car's idling, it means it's doing nothing, it's sitting there, just ticking along, making a noise, and uh, not... It's not serving its purpose. The car is to drive somewhere and when you put in drive, then you go, put in and you let the car idle, then you're not going anywhere. So any words that don't go anywhere are what? Are idle. They don't serve actually any purpose whatsoever. Now we, we include a lot of them in our, our conversation. It's a lot of words that actually don't mean anything. They're, they're, I mean, you, you listen to a conversation of the world today and count how many words actually don't belong in the sentence and don't actually help the sentence ma- communicate what they really want to say. You count them. And then we have to examine ourselves, is this what we're feeding upon? And we'd realise that we could save a lot of energy by getting rid of all the idle words Maybe that's a problem to the greenhouse problem. If everyone stopped their idle words, there'd be less hot air going up and we could get down to being ready for Jesus to come and having the new earth rebuilt. It continues, it says, joking and jesting, speaking idle words, we must give an account of what we say to God. We will be brought into judgment for our hasty words that do no good to the speaker or to the hearer. Then let us all speak words that will tend to edification. Remember that you, are the value, that you are of value with God. God loves you. Allow no cheap, foolish talk or wrong principles to compose your Christian experience. Now this message is not to condemn anybody, but this is just to awaken the mind to the causes of mental problems. And when people feed on media and on the television, and the children grow up on the cartoons, and all this rubbish, and they feed on that, and then they don't take long, and they're mentally unstable, and we go, what happened to them? And we wonder why, because of what we're feeding, and we need to make a decision for our own children's sake to feed them with good food, mental food, to put a stop to all this worldly media and say, no, this shall, I will not eat of these dishes. I'll only eat healthful food. Now Proverbs 17 verse 22. Proverbs 17 verse 22. A merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. I, I think that's interesting, you know, when someone's broken spirit or stressed out. Do you know what stress does? Stress makes your system very acidic. And you know how the body compensates for the acid that's going through your, your system? It needs something alkaline, and there's a thing called calcium that's alkaline, and it will take it out of your bones 
to neutralize your system, which is so acidic, and your bones will get dry. That's what happens. And it says, a merry heart. Now, that, is that talking about frivolity or true happiness? To be cheerful. It's not talking about frivolity. In fact, if you look at most comedians, they're the most depressed people in the world. You go to a party and there's the, there's the fun guy at the party who's always laughing and joking. And yet, when you go home and if you were to be a fly on the wall, you'd see him the most suffering and saddest person out of the lot. Because people become manic depressants. They're on a huge high, so happy, laughing, and everyone thinks they're the coolest people. And then they come so low and crash at the bottom. So it's not talking about frivolity. It's talking about genuine happiness. To, to be able to rejoice. Now, do you think you could have do you think you could have good health without the sunshine? You can't have bodily health without sunshine. Now, do you think you can have mental health without the sunshine? You can't. We need to have the sunshine affects our body and creates happiness. When it's a sunny day, Generally, people are more happier than when it's cold, dark, and raining. Because the sunshine makes us happy. So when we're talking about mental sunshine, we're talking about happiness. And to be happy requires light to come into our eyeball. And when light comes into our eyes, that will make an effect. So what I look upon must be what? Must be light. Must be happy. Now, I can't look at the darkness and expect to get the result that you get from the sun. Because I'm looking at darkness. If I will concentrate my mind's eye upon negativities, how can I expect to be happy? You can't. You can't expect to be happy. You actually have to turn your eyes to the light. And the Bible says in Malachi 4 and verse 2, that Malachi 4 and verse 2 states this. It says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So this is talking about a dawning of true happiness. It's not a quick, fix, a quick fix happiness where you just look for something just to cheer up just momentarily. This is a dawning, a, a slow progress of rays of light that start to brighten your life. And you have to employ your mind into looking at that. And your eye, your mind's eye is the avenue in which the light will penetrate your mind. Now you're in control of your own eyes. It's up to you where you look. And so the Bible, Jesus says in Matthew 6 verse 22, that if the light, the light of the body is the eye. And if your eye be single, your whole body shall be what? Shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, then your whole body shall be full of darkness. And then it says, no man can serve two masters. You can't look at the darkness and the light at the same time. Can't do it. So you have to choose. And you have to look. And who is the light of the world? Jesus Christ. And we need to get the rejoicing from the Lord. And that requires our mind to see Him and to dwell upon Him. And Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. And then it continues. Let's turn there and continue to read onwards. It says, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4.
Verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, do you expect to be happy if you get all the, all the disasters that are going on in the world and all the negativities that are published every, at every corner of the street? Would that make you happy? Then don't look at it. Don't look at it. You can't expect to be happy while looking at it. You have to stop. Either that or be sad. And keep looking at it. And so this connects so tightly with what food you mentally eat. Nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontent thoughts and feelings as much as it is a duty to pray. If we are heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners groaning and complaining all the way along to our father's house? If we actually knew what's, what preparations God has in store for us, we couldn't drag our feet. We could be happy. But how will you know unless you look at what God has prepared for us? We have to dwell. And uh, when we were in Papua New Guinea, Brother Ben did a, shared a study on what is heaven. What, was it? what is heaven like? Oh, I tell you, that made me so happy after hearing that. I mean, yeah, I've heard it before, but I don't think you can not hear it enough it is so encouraging to go through a study of what heaven is really like and where we're going and it and it just lifts your heart but you've got to look if you don't look what do you expect what do we expect if we don't take it and look at it and look at it long enough because at first you look at the source that's pretty dark too let the sun arise just keep watching and the colours will start coming out. Keep watching and the, all the full detail will come out until it's full noonday in your eye. Wow. And then you're happy. Now, I'm going to have to continue this sermon at prayer meeting because we're only halfway. <laughs> There, are, there is one thing that I want to just share here in regards to a source of um, mental illness. And that is found in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 12. Let's just look at this and we're going to do the rest of this at prayer meeting. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 12. And it says, And further, by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the what? Of the flesh. Too much study wearies the flesh, tires the body and the mind. Too much study. And I read here from a statement in se Selected Messages. Second Selected Messages. 
Page 436. In the schoolroom, the foundation has been too surely laid for disease of various kinds, but more especially the most delicate of all organs, the brain, has often been prematurely injured by too great exercise. This has often caused inflammation, then um, dropsy of the head and convulsions, with the dreaded results and the lives of many have thus been sacrificed by ambitious mothers of who of those children who have apparently had sufficient force of constitution to survive this treatment there are very many who carry the effects of it through life the nervous energy of the brain becomes so weakened that after they come to maturity it is impossible for them to endure much mental exercise the force of some of the delicate organs of the brain seemed to be expended. So what is it saying? That little children, when they get pushed and pushed, it causes disease upon the children and behavioural problems upon the children. And then we think, well, maybe they've got ADHD or some other problem. When what's actually happened is their brain's been way overtaxed whether it be through stress in the home or whether it be in the schoolroom of too many books, too much learning, push, push. We've got to get our kids learning fast, early learning. And that sounds, sends the foundation for problem after problem after problem. And then when they become adults, they can't trace it back. They can't trace it back from, from the schooling of our modern day. And so many students have depression. Same goes in university. There's another statement where it talks about that people feel that they have to put two lots of subjects or two lots of courses in one just to, just to get their goal. And Ellen White writes, it will just wreck your life if you do it. And so the brain gets strained. And the brain strain causes mental instability. And so the Lord wants us to rest, not to overstudy. We must study the Bible. And even studying the Bible, we can study too much. Too much study wearies the flesh. And so Jesus' words is to his disciples, come and rest a while. Come and have a break. And so there must be time given for time in nature just to, just to not think too hard, just to relax. To let the mind be at rest for a little bit. Just like anybody, when I was with a friend and he was, he was experienced in, in uh, bodybuilding and he said that you, you don't do it every day. You have to give time for your muscles to heal because when you really pump your muscles, they tear. And then you've got to give them time to repair. And as they repair, they actually get bigger in repairing the, the minute tears that happen in the muscles. And if you don't let it rest, you'll just damage yourself. It's the same with the brain. That if too much mind exercise is on and on and on, then there'll be difficulties Later, whether the difficulties manifest themselves, and it depends on the constitution of the person. Someone can say, well, my granddad, he did this and this and this, and he lived to 120 and is perfectly fine. That doesn't give license for everyone else to do it. He might have had a really good co constitution, but others, not so strong. And they do the same thing, and they come out with all sorts of results. And so the gospel of Christ is balanced doesn't require us to study day and night. We learn by practice. Read something, put it into practice. He that doeth my words is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. But if he that heareth and doesn't do it is like a foolish man. Well, if he's not doing it, what is he doing? He's only hearing. He's just a learning, learning, learning and no action, no practice. 
The best educational system is apprenticeships. Because you learn a little and you do a little. And then you go back and learn a little bit more and then you do a little bit more until you become a master tradesman and you can cope. And so, as I mentioned, that we'll conclude the rest of this message at prayer meeting because um, too much study wearies the flesh. So, um, shall we conclude then and, and uh, sing another hymn?